So, I already introduced myself to you guys, but my name is Gordon West. I live out in Oregon, and, and this, this conference has always managed such a unique, beautiful experience. Uh, it means a lot to my heart. So, I just, I'm always thankful that my wife, uh, my bride, makes that sacrifice because you have to go out there. But, like I told you guys, if I don't go back, change, I don't get to go back. So, yeah. that's always the goal, right? <clears throat> that's right. So, I've got my beautiful bride here, Jessica. She's a third grade teacher. We've been married 17 years now. We both somehow ended up uh, working with youth. Yeah, she's got she's got a great heart, and, and I, I always love what teachers do. Just the way they they don't get a choice of who they pour into. So it's uh, it's got its challenges. She just got her new class this year, and it's got its challenges. So I'm praying for her and bless her heart. Got my daughters up here. Abby, she's my 15 year old. She's uh, learning to drive. That's, it. That's an experience. You want to talk about learning to submit? There it is. Uh, take the wheel. Uh, but she's, man, she's got a great heart. She uh, serves in our middle school ministry at church. Um, we're, we're in that now process of boys and relationships and boyfriends. And that is, that is a challenge, but man, she's got a good heart, beautiful heart. My youngest, Maggie, man, she's a firecracker. That girl will chew you up and spit you out if you're not careful. Man, she's she's just got a she's got a heart. She loves she loves creating and building stuff, and and she's just go go go. Which yeah, my nickname when I was a little kid was go go. I don't know where she gets it from. I don't think it was me. I like to think I was pretty calm, but uh, she's she's a firecracker. She's fun. Um, a little bit about my career. I've been working full time for 19 years, uh, 20 plus in the field of Juvenile Corrections, working with youth on probation who, you know, they've made some poor choices. I don't know if you guys can relate to kids making poor choices, but, yeah, these guys, they're, they're, most of them are either going on probation or they're already on probation. I know the, the spot I work is, it's a three-month program that's really designed. Most of our kids are going to be going back in the community, so it's a lot of cognitive training, trying to get them to think before they act. A lot of life skills, a lot of just coaching and one-on-one, -on -one just mentorship conversations. Um, and one of the things that I've learned, most of that stuff isn't going to stick. Like you're planting seeds that eventually come to fruition. Like we have, we have guys come back ten years later with their family, and it's like, hey, in the moment, I didn't get. It. But as I got a little older, a little more mature, some of those things you taught and said, they had the impact that, that you were looking. And I don't know if you guys can relate, but doesn't that sound like most of our teams, right? Mm -hmm. We're teaching, we're guiding, but they just don't get because it takes time. Um, and I've been blessed to serve in our, our middle school ministry for the last three years, uh, going on four years now. And, and those guys give me so much life and joy. It's so much fun. Um, serving with our high schoolers for the last year, those guys give me so much grief. Like, my house has been teepee twice in the last month and a half. That's love. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is like, man, you want to affect change, you have to have connection, you have to have relationships. And you're either going to build a positive relationship that's guiding them where you want, or you're you're destroying them. And I mean, that's what we're going to kind of get in and talk about. Because, let's look at it guys, our role is dads, right? We're building a foundation of discipleship that points to Christ. That's what we're called to do. In your home, you and your bride are the you are the culture creators in your house. It's up to you to create the culture that you you want your kids to live out and build that foundation on. We're men. It is our job to be the leader in that. It's not an easy job. It's a hard job. Discipleship is never easy. Because discipleship means you're down in the muck, walking through it with them. You're teaching them, you're instructing them, you're guiding them, you're trying to build them into what you want. And as dads, as grandpas, as mentors, as people who work in youth ministry, that's our goal, right? Let's talk about father wounds. I have several, and they hurt deeply. As a dad, I know I'm going to create them. It's not a, it's not a if, it's a when. We will create father wounds. But our, our role as men, we're trying to mitigate those father wounds, right? We're trying to lessen that impact. Exodus 25 says, The inequities of the father are visited upon the sons and daughters unto the third and fourth generation. There's a lot of stuff my dad taught me that 
wasn't good. I still see it in how I interact with my kids and people. And it, it breaks my heart every time. But there are some things, some of those generational curses that, that I have broken from my family. Uh, substance abuse, addiction. Um, letting my kids know I'm proud of them. We need to mitigate those causes. So how do we do it? Your kids see you fall. They're going to. How do they see you respond to that fall? Do they see you get up, own it, and then take steps to move on? Or do they see you ignore it, hide it, keep the same behaviors going? If you're going to mitigate those father wounds, you've got to let them see the process. Because how many of our kids are going to screw up? They need to learn how to take those next steps to move on past that problem. There's enough shame in the world. We don't want to live in that. So, how do we do it? Ephesians 6, 4 says, Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Proverbs 13, 24, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Discipline. Instruction. It didn't say punishment. I want you guys to keep that in the back of your mind as we, we have this talk today. It's not saying punishment. We're talking about discipline instruction. We talk about God being a good shepherd, right? We're called to be the shepherds of our family, of, our, of the youth we work with in schools and in church. That's why I love Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I mean, if we know anything about shepherds, they had two tools. They had the rod and the staff. We're going to look at those a little bit more. But the rod and the staff, they didn't, they didn't bring me anxiety. They didn't bring me anguish or pain. They comfort me. And I think if, if we're honest, that's kind, of, that's kind of what we're called to do with our kids. Right? So let's talk about discipline. It's the quality of being able to behave and work in a controlled way, which involves obeying particular rules and standards. I set my standards in my house, these rules, these things that, that I want my kids to follow. Right? The discipline is them being able to do that be able to fall under those rules and, and live them out. And as I looked this up in, on uh, the, online, the, the, uh, the Greek word that they use for discipline in both of those verses is, is idea. And it means tutorage. What tutorage means is education and training. By implication, by disciplinary correction, it involves chastening, chastisement, instruction, and nurturing. I had to look up chastening because I had no idea what it was. And it basically means a reproof, a warning. And it also means instruction. So discipline. When I think about my daily disciplines in life, right, my time with God, going to the gym and stuff like that, it wasn't built overnight. It started with small choices that created habits. Disciplines often determine what our habits are, right? My kids need to see my daily discipline so that they can learn what discipline looks like. Because there's days I don't want to. There's a lot of days I don't want to go to the gym. I'll even show up in the mindset of, I don't want to be here. And that has a dramatic impact on what I'm doing. It's wasting a lot of time, if I'm honest. Our kids need to see what daily discipline looks like. So I've been working with these, these youth I worked with for you know, 20 years. They want structure. They want discipline. They need consequences. And they seek out those boundaries. A lot of what they do is trying to set their limits and see see what's safe, see where they can take things and be okay. And that's, a, that's an entirely normal thing. It's something we need to expect. Consequences are necessary. Our kids need to know that choices have action, or, con, or actions have consequences. But consequence, the word is just a result of. It's not a bad thing. There's consequences to doing. And if you, you study hard and you know, put an effort, you're going to do great on the test. That's the consequence of it. The consequence is we want to make it seem negative, but it's not. But they're necessary. We need to have something set up that, hey, you're messing up here. We're going to do this. My daughter, you know, she's not focused on her schoolwork. She's letting her grades go. You know what? I might take your phone away. You might not be going out with friends. And that's great. That's a consequence. But without correction, what did I do? I didn't do anything. There's nothing that's going to help instruct and grow them, right? It needs to be correction over consequence. 
And if you're not using those moments as teachable moments to build them, to grow them, like me at the gym and I don't want to be there, I'm just wasting time. So with those two, uh, those two tools that Shepard had, they had the rod, they had the staff. The rod was a short light club that, when you, they would use it to, you know, guide the sheep to nudge them, to prod them back to where they needed to go. It was also used as a weapon, as protection to defend them against wolves. Raise your hand if you've used your rod to punish your kids, to try to beat them back into submission. A tool that's supposed to be used to protect them that you're now using to harm them. That's me. I've done it too many times. And it's something I'm still growing. The rod wasn't designed for that. It's protection and it's prodding them back, getting them back to where they need to be. And that's what discipline is. That's how their consequences need to be, moving them back in the right direction. It's not a punishment. It's just a result of the behavior. Too often, punishment is something that it comes out of an emotional response, right? Guys, if I'm going to discipline my kids out of anger, that's sin. I can't do that. I've got to, I mean, if I'm expecting them to make choices, or they, they remove themselves from the emotion and then make the choice, if I'm going to discipline, i got to do that. I've got to move out of my emotion, think, okay, what's going to be best for my kid? And then process and work through, right? Let's talk about instruction. It's this Greek word, I hope I did that right. It basically means to call attention to, by implication, mild rebuke or warning. And not admonition. I had to look up admonition, didn't know what that word was. It means to place on one's mind, often by authoritative counsel. Our kids don't know what they don't know. They need us to help guide them, help them look long term to make choices. That authoritative counsel, it's us, it's a trusted, friend that we have speaking into their life. When we look at the staff, it was this longer tool, had a crook in the neck, you know, it was used to wrap around the neck and pull them back, to guide them back into where they need to be. That's what our instruction is supposed to do. It's guiding them back to where they need to be. We all know parenting is hard. We all know working with teams is incredibly hard. And one of the most difficult things is we see mistakes, we see choices that they're making, and we know the results aren't going to be good. And the hardest thing that I've found as a dad is, I've got that crook, I'm ready to put it around their neck. But when do I pull back and let them walk into a mistake knowing that it's going to hurt, it's going to cause some pain, but for them to grow the way they need to, I've got to let them step into that mistake. I mean, I want to protect my kids from everything. But that's also not the best, best approach. They have to be able to learn and, and test those boundaries on their own. But it's knowing when to do it. And there's no answer. It's, it's just, it comes by feel and trial and error and hopefully God's speaking in you and letting you know. It's not a prayer. Talk about those teaching moments, right? Our instruction needs to be designed. How are we teaching them? How are we growing them? What skills are we teaching? What boundaries are we trying to reinforce and set? Where are we letting them test that? To bring them up in the ways of the Lord, we need them to see what those disciplines look like. They need to see me in prayer. They need to see what being in the Word looks like. But they also need to be invited into that. Because I can watch and I can learn. But it's different if I'm taking part of it. Too often, oh, it's my quiet time. It's my prayer time. It's me taking care of me. Which is important. But if I'm not including them and bringing them in, who's going to teach them that? I mean, it's a scary world out there. If it's not me, likely it's their peer group. My daughters have some great friends, but I'm not going to trust them to build them in a discipline. I talked about the, the kids at my work, right? Those seeds that we plant, we won't see the fruition for a while. We don't want to take that personally. Right? We don't want to be seeking that instant gratification of, oh, I, I taught you this and now you're changed and make it about you. The same thing with when we, when we go tell somebody about Jesus, right? It's not my job to change their heart. I'm just tossing seeds out and waiting for God to let them grow. That's on him. It's a process. It takes time. <coughs> so, I love Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. 
So we're about to jump into the boring section of this, the section looking at the brain and what it's doing and growing. But I want you guys to remember, we're here to be the best dad, the best leaders of youth, the best men who can speak into, into their lives, right? That, that should be our goal. If we don't understand what they're going through, we don't have much hope in this. Right? I'm 42. I've got a brain fully developed, adult thinking, comprehension, the ability to you know, focus and interact. I suck sometimes. Like I still get it wrong a lot. Why am I expecting my 15-year-old, my 11-year-old? Why am I holding them to the same standards and expectations I have for myself? Because I don't get it. And I know, I, I know this material, I know their brain isn't there, yet I'm still trying to hold them to that same level of expectation. So really the goal, guys, I'm going to give you a bunch of information. Just take it, have it in the back of your mind, so when you are interacting with kids, you're like, oh yeah, that's right. I probably don't have that skill yet. Just to use it and help you guys maybe maneuver a different way to work with them, to instruct them and, and guide them. All right, now for the goal. So what the heck are they thinking, right? We're going to look at look at the teenage brain, <coughs> what it's doing, how it's growing. And I love this comment too, because how often do we think our kids' brain just dipped out and is gone? Like, there's not much going on in the So, let's start with traits of a toddler. Toddlers, if you can remember back that far, I've got, and it's been a while for me, but man, I remember they struggled with impulse control. They had mood swings. Their ego was all about them. Risk taking, they wanted independence, they need structure. Oh Lord, did they test limits to know how to push buttons? And they slipped like they're a bear. The reason for this, <laughs> during, the, during those toddler years, the brain is going through an incredible amount of growth and development. All these connections are being formed. And it, it explains why a lot of this is going on. So let's look at traits of a teenager. Oh, it didn't change. Right. Our teenagers struggle with impulse control, mood swings. <laughs> it is always about them. Risk taking, independent structure. They definitely know how to push limits and test boundaries, right? Why? The level of brain growth in a toddler, almost the exact same level of growth happens when they're teenagers. Their brains actually completely rewire. So those connections they had to be able to follow directions and listen, they're not there anymore. They're rewiring and reforming. The brain literally grows so much that our, our teenagers, it's like we're raising toddlers again. They're just bigger and clumsier. So, adolescence, man, it's a time of growth and maturation. There's an incredible amount of relearning that helps them become more effective as their brains continue to process and grow. This is kind of your average teenage brain, right? Rebellion, love, very little homework and chores, communication skills non-existent. Kind of looks like our average teenager. Slamming your parents with their pockets. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. yeah, yeah. I mean, love for the parent, hate for the parent. It depends on the minute. I mean, it depends on what I'm asking them to do. Yeah, that's just about right. Let's talk about it. So our brains actually, as they, they go through that second growth and development, they, they develop from the back to the front. So closer to the back, we have the, the hippocampus, and it's it's your where memories form, where memories are stored. It's the short term, long term, also some emotional processing is going on. We have it as adults. We just start to lose it, which is probably why my friend Brent got lost and couldn't find where he was going today. Uh, but teens, man, it's it's such an incredible learning curve because all of a sudden the skills you had they're gone, and it's trying to figure it out again. So that, that's actually one of the first ones to develop. Then we've got the uh, parietal lobe. It's the big yellow one, kind of. Um, and that's where you're interpreting senses. All those five senses coming in, that's where they're being input. It's the spatial awareness and coordination. My oldest, she dances, she does acro dance, ballet. Incredibly graceful, like, incredibly graceful. Yet, when she's not in that training setting, She'll trip over the wind, and she's clumsy as about get out. It's crazy. Their brain's processing and developing, and that's, that's kind of why they uh, they get a little clunky at times. Uh, the next one's the the ventral stratum. This is where your interpretive rewards and reinforcement. 
you're kind of processing what you expect versus what the reality is. This one's not this one's not developing first. It's where a lot of motivation comes into play. Uh, some of the risk taking happens here. The why behind why they're doing stuff. There's an incredible amount of learning this where they've learned from watching others. So as that grows and develops, they become better at that. Next we have the amygdala, which is this little almond-like thing kind of towards the uh, front middle. Any of you guys feel like the teenagers are incredibly emotional? They respond incredibly quick. It's super high, high degrees. Like it's zero to 60 and there's nothing in between. This is why. This is where the main emotional hub is. It's where they process emotional significance. The events that are coming in, they're trying to determine an appropriate response. But they just don't have it yet because it's all emotional right there. It, uh, it's good. It's, it's a great part of the brain that's going to help them learn to test limits and, and, and process emotion, but it's also, in the teenagers, it's incredibly volatile. We move on to the prefrontal cortex, the very front of your brain, the last part to develop. We know that it doesn't develop until the mid-20s, and that's when that full level and range of thinking comes in. It helps with decision-making, reasoning, expressing personality, problem-solving, helps regulate emotions, and it's the last to develop. It's the part of the brain that I expect my kids to follow when it's not developed. It explains most of their, their poor choices and lack of judgment because it's not there. So we're going to look at, look at that prefrontal cortex a little more. It's like the CEO of the brain. It helps make choices. It's processing that flood of information coming in. I mean, there's a lot of information our kids are bringing in, right? Especially once we give them one of these suckers. It helps balance you know, the emotion versus the sound decision making, analyzing risk versus reward. It's the part that we wish was in the back of the brain because it would make our lives a lot easier. What's it mean in terms of behavior? And you feel like the kids lack common sense. Their thinking is very black and white. There's no, there's no gray in there. It's just one or the other. Decisions seem irrational. And they're disorganized. And the average, the average uh, teenager. But this is that thinking part of the brand that it's not developed. So, anybody feel like they're uh, teen struggling decision making? So actually, they actually reach adult levels of decision making by about 15. But that doesn't mean they make adult decisions yet. So they still have that high rate of poor decisions. Like there, there was a study out of uh, Temple University that put adults and teens in a driving situation, alone and then with friends. Alone. And teens actually make pretty good choices on the same level as adults. You put them in there with a the peer, and all of a sudden that risk level went way up, and they were doing some, some silly stuff. Where as adults with peers, nothing changed. How do we feel about our, uh, our kids' peer groups? Because they're impactful. They're gonna they're gonna leave a huge uh, huge print on on our kids and what they're doing. Which is why, I mean, as a dad, I know my kids' friends. I know who they're hanging out with. And, and they're incredibly vetted because I know that my kids are going to be spending a lot of time and going to them. So our, 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 our kids make risky behaviors. This is this is actually a X-ray in my head. If you guys don't know, it's pretty cool. So this is still looking at that prefrontal cortex area, right? It's in charge of emotional control, insight, focus, forethought, impulse control, organization, planning, judgment. And so we look at emotional control. Man, how often are teams, right? We want them to be able to control impulse. We want them to be able to control emotions. But they often react quickly out of negative emotions and being able to control it. Because that part of the brain is not formed. Insight. Teenagers have difficulty speculating about other people's behaviors and motivations. Often drawing their own conclusions, right? Hey, you see people over there talking, you think they're talking about you, you're going to get upset about it. I'm going to be honest, guys, I struggle with that still. Like, I, I struggle with that insight. So why do I expect my team to do better than I can do? Anybody feel like your teenagers aren't focused? Like they just bounce from one thing to the other? They're distracted. They've got a lot of information coming in. And if the prefrontal cortex is the part that filters that and helps them process and organize, not developed yet. Forethought, 
they find it difficult to predict consequences to real or potential behavioral choices, and they run with the, uh, the emotional center. This part's not there. Impulse control, and that governor that helps them guide them and moderate that, that response to impulses. Anybody have a team who struggles with lying or has seen that? Because it's reactionary. They don't have that ability to stop and think and then process, hey, what am I doing here? Organization, just go to my daughter's room. I can tell you a lot about organization. But even with tasks and stuff, they struggle with the process of organizing things in a way that's gonna, gonna get it done. Like they, they really, they don't have the ability yet. And then planning, without this, they, they really live in a here and now. They don't, they can't think forward past, you know, today, five minutes, whatever it is. Until this part is developed, they're gonna struggle. They're gonna struggle to plan and process and, and figure things out. Judgment. Our kids are gonna take risks. They're gonna struggle with those judgment type behaviors, right? We want them to make good judgment calls. Too often it's it's just an impulse reaction to what they don't think. Understanding that is gonna help us. Hey, how can I teach you better instead of hey? You did it again. And then empathy. This is hard for me because I've struggled with empathy as an adult. They struggle with how their choices are going to impact others. It's all about them. You saw those traits in the beginning, that ego, it's all about me. They don't understand how choices, how responses, how just that one word that someone might try to contact could, could impact others. And let's be honest, we struggle with it. But until they, that brain develops, they don't have the ability to see someone else's point of view. It makes it tough. All right, let's get out of the pre cortex for a while. It's, it's boring, all right? The amygdala, that center of the brain that, that controls emotions. This is what's developing way before they're able to focus on you know, thinking and forethought. It's a little almond-shaped thing in the, the middle of the brain. This is where those gut reactions are coming, those quick emotional responses. And this is where teens process most of their information. A tiny little part full of energy and emotion. We wonder why they're volatile. We wonder why they struggle. They're using this part of the brain. And it's okay because it's how our brains grow. <clears throat> so in terms of behavior, it makes them impulsive. They have mood changes really quickly. They can't control emotions. They're gonna seek out risks. It's just who they are. This is part of setting healthy boundaries and expectations, right? This is where we as dads, we as mentors, coaches, how far do I let them go before you know I, I've got to step in? So when we look at brain development, there's three processes that are happening. There's proliferation, which is growth. Not only growth in size, but growth in all those connections that are going to help us process all the information coming in. Pruning, they're cutting away the unused, unimportant connections. And myelination, that's basically those, those roads we're building on our brain they're getting insulated, they're getting faster, stronger, and better to help us process information in a, in a more effective manner. So proliferation, that brain volume, the size. By age six, your brain is almost fully grown. It's not gonna get much bigger. I know this because with this small head, there's not much out there. By teenage years, it's actually fully developed as far as size. Boys have a little bit bigger, girls have a smaller brain, has nothing to do with processing and thinking, as my wife would tell you. Hey, it's only bigger in size. It doesn't mean you're using it, right? Hey, she's got a smaller brain and she's making better choices. <laughs> um, so two types of brain matter. We've got gray and we've got white. Gray matter, it looks gray. It's composed of neurons, cells, dendrites. It's this gray, mushy thing. White matter. It looks white, it's made of axons. Those are those connections that are forming to help information pass. And this slide will explain it a lot better. So gray matter is where all the thinking happens. It's the processing, it's what's going on up here that's helping us control everything down here. White matter has those axons, it's like a super highway of information. It's building those branches of things that are how we're using and processing information. Anybody ever uh, read anything about in the Bible? Mm -hmm. yeah. I go out in February and we've got rose bushes and the 
apparently President's Day when you're supposed to prune them out in the wet, rainy, cold of Oregon. Why? Why do we prune? Because there's a lot of growth on those rose bushes that do nothing. It's just sucking energy and life away from areas that can actually use it. Cut those off. Those life giving areas now grow better. They flourish. God does the same thing with us, right? We say, God, hey, come in here with your scalpel. Cut away what I don't need. And he does. He's going to cut away those things that make you ineffective to pursuing and seeking and guiding people to him. It's painful. It's never good. Or it's always good, but it's always you know, it's painful. With the brain, it's going to do the same thing. There are useless connections, things going places that, that aren't doing anything. So the brain actually does that same process. Those pathways that we're using, that we're building, you know, this use it or lose it kind of thing, those get bigger and better. The ones that we're not using, they disappear. So what pathways are we building in our kids? The choices they make, the experiences they have are going to build those pathways. The memories they have have a huge impact on that. Believe it or not, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, I remember more powerfully negative interactions and responses I had, especially from my dad, that had a huge impact on what my brain was doing. You know, my job, we... We have this idea where you want to try and have seven positive reinforcements versus you know one negative. You're trying to build up that that positive thing, and that's hard. Sometimes it's just, hey, you didn't blow out here. It was, you know, it's still a struggle. Hey, you did better. You're making you're making progress. Our brain is like that. Those pathways we build, the progress we're making, we want to guide our, our kids in a way that's going to be shaped more by, more by positive experiences. And those things that are unused, they get cut away. But the beauty is these teenage brains, they're versatile. They can adapt really quickly. They're very, not so much efficient, but they have the processing power that, man, I wish I had. I wish I could just go, 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 go. My brain doesn't do it anymore. So proliferation and myelination. So we've got the brain growth, now we've got that matter being insulated in there. The, the myelin, what it's doing is protecting those pathways, that, that highway of information that, that we're building to send information is helping protect it. It's helping us conduct that information more quickly and it's making it stronger. So as their brains develop, they, they, they will always continue to build these connections. It's just the ones they, they continue to build, they get bigger, faster, stronger. The ones that, that they don't, they start to die away. And we're hopefully, we have time to be jumping to the technology piece at the end of this that looks at how that's now playing. So I'll try and go fast. I like it like this, right? We start out with a single lane road as we're building these connections. The more we build it, we end up with a nice, nice little two lane road. But our goal is this, right? It's a super highway where information is flying, where we're able to process everything coming in in an efficient manner so that we can make the best choice possible. All right. So traits of a teenager. We've already looked at all these these behaviors, these struggles they have, this ego, right? They're, they're living out of their emotional center. Obviously, it's all about them. They struggle with impulse control. They need structure. They want independence. And the struggle is we, you know, we just went over. They, they don't have the ability to process and, and grow in a lot of these areas yet. So what do they need? Right? Adolescence is a time when many new behaviors are going to emerge. Most of them are going to irritate and frustrate us. So let's look at some behavior changes. Anybody feel like their kids can't focus? They have no attention anymore? Motivation, like what are they motivated by? What's driving them? Uh, can we even get them out of bed? And risk taking. Incredible amount of risk taking as a, as a team. So, attention. Are you listening? <clears throat> you feel like you tell your kids something and they look at you with glassy eyes like they weren't even there? So we know that as they were growing from toddler to about 10, they had those connections. They could listen. They had the ability. So if the brain's rewiring, maybe that connection's not there. Maybe they, they really can't process what they're hearing, which should change how I approach them, right? If it's not, really, didn't listen again, you just can't figure it out, what's wrong with you? Okay. Maybe, maybe you really can't process this. So what do I do? I've got to teach you skills. I've got to give you instruction. Maybe it's, hey, repeat back to me what I said so I know you understand. 
oftentimes it's, we'll give you one task. Go do this, and when you're done, come back and I'll give you another one. Yeah. Because they just don't have that ability. I expect it out of them because, well, this is my level of thinking. I can't do that. i got to meet them where they're at. I guess I don't. If I care about them, I want them to grow, I've got to meet them where they're at. Motivation. I won't make their bed. They just don't care. They're just, ugh. That is, I, I can relate to that with both of my girls. It is not, it's not easy getting them wanting to do something. And there's a reason for that, right? We look at motivation in the adults, or in uh, team brains versus adult brains. When doing the same task, looking at the reward for it, not a whole lot going on over there in that, that, that little section, right? <laughs> not much being activated when they're looking at, yeah, I'm going to do this based on the reward. But when you give them something incredible, something instant, that's going to light up a little more, which often explains if we want them to do something, there's got to be a big payoff for them that they see because they don't have the ability to kind of look out long term and what that growth and what we want. But that's okay because they underuse that motivational system. Right? They look at and need extreme rewards to, see that, to achieve that same level of brain activity. It's going to get there. There is hope. It's just going to take time. Eventually, they will. So eventually, they're going to go from this novelty-seeking, risk-taking, you know, focused in that amygdala part of the brain, out of emotion. They're going to get to the point where it's they're kind of like a, they're looking long-term. What's going to be better for me? Those responsibilities of, hey, I'm going to get this paper done now, even though it's not due for a month. Because then it frees me up for all these other things. I was horrible at procrastination, and I waited until the last minute. Darn near bit me every time. But eventually they're going to be able to take in the information and process it through the front so that they can override some of those short term, hey, I want to do this instead. Risk taking. Teams are known for risk taking. Let me tell you a story. Yeah. I was 15. My cousin and I, he had a, a car out of my grandma. She's got 80 acres, grass field, a little bumpy, but like, hey, take a, take a trunk off the car. Mm -hmm. We're going to weld on two handles. Let's tie a rope to it, to the car, and let's go uh, sled through the field. Yeah, it was so much fun. Yeah, that's fun. Until, uh, until some concussions, uh, some, you get scrapes and bruises. This is also the same cousin that, hey, like Cowboys and Indians. There's a tree fort here. You go up there with your BB gun. I'll be down here with a real bow and arrow and we'll play. Yeah. yeah. Stupid, right? We need BB guns. We have a bow and arrow. <laughs> oh, it, to be fair, it was a dull one. It wasn't the point of yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, still, that, not that that matters. But still. <laughs> but the thinking of it, there was no like, oh, yeah. this, this could end badly. This is, gonna, this, this is stupid. It was like, fuck him and hey, let's go do this. And we did it. How often does that describe our, our, our team's risk taking, right? It's like, why are they thinking? Why? They're not. They're not. It's just, hey, this sounds like a fun idea. Let's go try it out. Luckily, we both live somehow. But, like we talked, risk taking, it, it's a normal behavior. It's something that needs to happen because if they're going to experience and learn how boundaries work at an adult level, they've got to take some risks. Right? They're going to explore adult behaviors and privileges. They're going to learn how to accomplish normal developmental tasks. And they're going to learn from their mistakes. Like I already said, man, it, it sucks to see your kid walk into something that you know is going to hurt. But they need to. My uh, my oldest daughter, Abby, and she was terrified the first year of going to, to middle school camp. COVID shut it down, so she only she got to go for two years. But she was terrified of being in a new group new situation, and she didn't want to go. But she took that, like, hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to kind of try and get past this anxiety. And just the experience of doing that, she absolutely loved it. She's now serving in our, in our middle school ministry at church because of the benefit she saw from it. 
So some risk taking is good, some risk taking is healthy. Shooting bow and arrows and BB guns and going through a field are not, but I didn't have much supervision for what happened there. So, you know, risk taking you know, carries a potential negative outcome, but it also carries, you know, an outcome that can be positive. It's up to us to help our kids walk through a process. They can't process, so we need to be able to do that with them. If I'm always talking down to my kid, always trying to punish and come down on them, I've now lost that relational equity to speak into their life when they need it most. So I've got to remember that when I'm, when I'm working with my kids. When I work at, with kids at work, man, they make boneheaded choices. I've got to be able to keep that relational equity so that when it matters, and there's a conversation that, that's going to keep them safe or help them most, I can do that. Because we're either going to burn bridges or we're going to build bridges, right? So risk taking, most of our kids are impulsive, right? This is looking at kind of that activation of impulsivity when based on age versus the prefrontal cortex, which is, you know, helping them. So this is their, where they're processing that emotion, kind of. This is where they're looking at the ability to process and make good choices. Teenagers, man, is that lit up. I can barely see what's going on over here. Adults, man, we, we can process emotion, but there's a lot going on up there. They don't have it yet. They're going to be impulsive. They're going to take risks. They're going to make choices that are, are very volatile. They're impulsive because those brain circuits, those those pathways aren't there yet. And that's just something for us to remember, right? That ability to inhibit behaviors matures gradually from childhood to adolescence, from adolescence to being an adult. It's a process. It takes time. So this whole risk-taking idea is kind of where what the heck are they thinking comes from? So when teenagers and adults are faced with kind of the same potential rewards, their brains respond differently. The top one, teenagers, you're looking at this reward system versus the control system on the bottom. The reward system pretty well lit up. The control system, there's not a lot going on there. There's a little bit, but not a lot. Completely changes in, in, in adults. And that's our toughest job. What the heck are they thinking? How are we going to help grow them? So, what do we do, right? They're going to take more risks. It's who they are. It's what their brains are doing. Some teens are even more prone to it. So what are, what are we going to do? What do teens need? Guys, they need support. They need influence, patience, understanding, guidance, grace. I've got a parents on there, but I'm thinking about it. Our kids need other trusted adults they can go to. I am so blessed to speak into the lives of men here at this conference. Like, I've got a guy who's 2,600 miles away, and I talk to his kid weekly, and we talk. And he'll share things with me that he doesn't, that he, that he can't necessarily, you know, process with his dad. I mean, I, he knows if, if something comes up at some stage and his dad needs to know, we're talking about it. But he can, I can be a sounding board for him, you know, a safe way to help him. And, you know, that comes with trust. That comes with knowing who's speaking into your kid. I've got guys who... They've got my daughter's number. They check in. My daughters can text and call. Because let's be honest, I'm a buffoon sometimes. And I make poor choices. I mean, and they can process with them. Not only does it help them, but then he's going to come back and say, what are you doing? You know, let's try something different. And it's a good reminder for me. But they need our support. They need that influence. Most, I mean, most of all, really, they need patience, right? If they can't process at that level, then why are we expecting them to? Be patient with the process of growing, right? <clears throat> they need reminders of potential consequences and direction towards the lesser, healthier risks. We already know that they're impulsive. They don't have the ability to control that, so we need to be there for them. And that only happens if we've built that relational equity, if we've got the lines of communication in place where we can speak into their lives. They need an appropriate amount of independence, freedom, and responsibility. They've got to be able to test boundaries. They've got to be able to say, hey, at some point, I'm going to go out in the adult world, and we've got to prepare them and let them fly, right? If we control everything, if we don't let them have that independence, freedom, and responsibility, what's going to happen? They're going to jump out of that nest and just squat, mm -hmm. and it's not going to be good. And it happens too often, right? Mm -hmm. We've got to let them make choices. 
we've got to be there to try and help guide them in those choices. We gotta let them grow. And hey, we still got time. Good. I like this part. Huh. How many of you guys have kids who have this? My my ten year old has one, which I didn't want her to have one, but man, in our neighborhood, she's out with her little gaggle of friends. That I need to know where she's at. But she's got one. She spends far too much time on it. But let's look at technology. Greatest benefit of, of this digital revolution is going to be of access to information. Never before has so much information been available to so many, right? Technology is not going anywhere. It's only going to continue to grow. So are we going to dig our heels in? Or are we going to grow with it? How are we going to set it up so our kids can be successful? Mm -hmm. One of the most important skills they're going to have is being able to take up in all this information, this mountain, this universe of information, and critically evaluate it understand it and apply it. So we already know they can't do this. We already know they can't critically think. They struggle with understanding problem solving. They just don't have those skills. The brain's not there yet. So we're going to give them one of these that's only going to make it worse. Yeah. But technology, most schools are tied to computers now. Technology is built in. So we've got to, we've got to figure out how we're going to best approach that. They need guidance because it's going to be a struggle without it. So, let's look at how technology has actually changed the brain. How do we take in information? How did you guys used to read books back in the day? When the threat that you're going to get in trouble if you don't. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I read books left to right. <laughs> yeah. Sentence by sentence, right? Yeah. Technology has actually changed the way we read. And I've noticed this. Um, even in my own reading, I love to read. I... I'm on like book 65 this year. And there's a purpose behind it. I'll tell you that in a minute. But we no longer read sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, page by page. We skim information, we find the, the keyword to highlight, and then we build context around it for most of the year. And that's great. And that's actually a good skill for our kids to have because they can take in a lot of information quickly and figure out what's useful. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Get information quicker. But there is a disconnect, right? There's a disconnect between what we're taking in and what we understand because the brain has changed how we take it in. It's all surface level. I don't need to remember anything anymore. It's all, it's all right here at my fingertips. So the reading has become surface level. There's not much of a deep dive of understanding. It's just, oh yeah, this. It's knowledge without wisdom. I mean, I can, I can read the Bible, but the Bible is useless unless I apply it and create wisdom out of it. It's kind of the same with a lot of the, the way they're taking in information. Yeah, it's there, but it's not really. It's just there when it's on the phone or on the computer screen. Anybody in here do TikTok? Anybody in here see kids who do TikTok? Yeah. Yeah, we've become a TikTok society. Like, as consumers, these 30 second minute videos, and then you're on to the next thing. These reels. These Facebook posts of just scrolling. We, we have become a scrolling society that's distracting. Yeah, multitasking is great, but multitasking without the focus and being able to process is just scrolling, right? Yeah. Anybody feel like we've kind of turned into this survival of the busiest society? Yeah. And our kids are being inundated with that. I, I could imagine being a teacher. You're now with. You can't get away from it. You got a bully at school. My day, that's one thing. You're going home and you're done, but now everything's connected. Like, yeah. it, it's hard. Yeah. So, teams who already struggle with problem solving, with processing information, we give them one of these and we expect them to make good choices that aren't risky. They're going to make some risky, some risky behavior. And it's, it's easy to hide, too. I mean, we can have all the blockers and stuff in place, but all it takes is one search and they figure out how to do it. It's tough. So, how's it changing our memory? We talked about the service level, right? We, we use that ability to deep dive and process. Like, I'm great at trivia. You want to go to a trivia night? I've got lots of useless information up here. But that's kind of what our kids are learning. They don't have to know anything. 
Like I know I know my, my bride's number and my grandma's phone number. I don't even know my kids' phone numbers. I don't I don't need to. Like I don't need to know a lot because I can just pull it up and see it. Which is changing changing our brains, how we're processing those pathways that we're trying to build towards critical thinking. You don't have to critical think if it's right here. Anybody feel like your phone is a disruption? Like those notifications come in, all of a sudden you've got this cortisol spike of like, oh, really? they're changing how we process and feel emotion, how we how we take things in. It's a struggle. They, uh, this drug-like response, right? We often want to look at drugs as this addictiveness. But when we really look at drugs, it's not about how addictive they are. It's It's about their ability to change mental and emotional states. That's what they do. Anybody feel like this has changed their emotional and mental state? If I take your phone, Michael, and I keep it in my pocket the rest of the day, what's going to happen? I promise it'll be okay. It'll be okay? Yeah. Do that to a team. What's going to happen? A world done. It's over, right? World life is done. Like there, there are times when, yeah, good consequences taking my kids home. And it's needed sometimes. But knowing their connection, it's also a balance of what you do. It's good leverage. It is great leverage. Sure. Yes. So our brains, you know, they release dopamine. They make us feel happy, like when we're playing games, when we're watching shows, when we're using this. So there's this drug-like response that's happening when we're, when we're, when we're using those things. Mm -hmm. When you cut it off, it really is withdrawal. You know, they go through these withdrawal-like symptoms, and it can get ugly. It can be painful. So, I got to stop going. What do we do? What do we do with technology? It's not going anywhere. It's here for the rest of their lives, and it's only going to become more pronounced. So, what do we do? We've got to be able to set limits, right? We've got to have those those barriers, those blockers, those things that are going to keep them safe in a digital realm. Maybe it's even, hey, you like video games? You're struggling getting your homework done. We're going to set a time limit on that. I love video games. Like, I grew up with the Nintendo, so, you know, it's been ingrained in me since 1985. Games aren't bad. They're a great escape. Um, but there have to be limits. And I remember in college, there were times when I really struggled with procrastination because I didn't have limits. I didn't have anybody there. And my brain still wasn't developed enough to process and make those choices. What would have helped? Man, it would have helped if I had mentors. All the people speaking into me, but but I didn't. But you know what's beautiful about the kids we have? They do. Mm -hmm. Michael, you're your students, and they've got a light that speaks into them. Mm -hmm. Working in ministry, and you have such a huge impact that you don't, you might not even recognize and realize. So we set limits on, on what they're doing, right? We also set those boundaries. Of, hey, this is a hard line of I'm not crossing that. I mean, if you look at studies of when most Teen boys are introduced to pornography before they were teen boys. Yeah. Yeah. And back in the day, you had to go find a magazine and flip it out and look at it. Mm -hmm. It's here mm -hmm. and it's hard. And they're after them. And they're after them. Mm -hmm. you've, got, mm -hmm. you've got friends and peer groups that gag in the wrong way. Yeah. Which is why the really the way you do it is communication. You only do that through that relational equity. Can you talk to your kids about can they listen? You've got to break it down from a way that they know that, hey, this is out of love, this is safe. They can come to you no matter what. But if my kid's going to come to me no matter what, then I need to make sure whatever my response is, mm -hmm. it's going to be based out of love. Otherwise, my kids aren't coming to me. It takes one time. It takes one time of screwing up for your kids to be like, nope, I'm not going back there again. It's not safe. And it's not safe. Right. So we've got to be able to check ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier how many books I read. Not, not so much a big break. I love to read. I found myself in my quiet time skimming, looking for keywords and building around it. I don't even read the Bible first thing anymore. I pull out my fiction book, which I like, and I train my brain to set by sentence, line by line. And it has helped so much this year of being able to jump in and actually read and, and get depth. Because it's, it's not much of a Christian walk, it's all service level. And if my reading time is service level, 
better believe my prayer time is surface level. You better believe my interactions are surface level. So for me, that reading time was able to eat. It's eating those connections in my brain back to being okay. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to take time. I'm going to process to set me up for success, right? So really, that's about all I got. You guys got questions? Anything you want to talk about? Yeah. Very good. I appreciate you guys coming. Really, like I said, man, my hope is that it just gives you something to think about and be responsive. Like I said, we can we can harm them very quickly with one response, or we can set up a you know character trait of hey, I'm trusted, I'm safe. Let's do this together. Yeah. Parenting and mentoring for me changed from molding them into who I thought. They needed to be yeah. to this is much maybe even more sometimes about my changing my thought process. Yeah. Oh, that was a hard one. Oh, you go next door to that guy over there, he'll tell you the hardest thing in parenting is parenting that you and your kid. Right. Right? Like yeah. and here's the truth. Every fault I have, those are the faults I'm hardest on my kids on this. Well you don't want them to go through some of the same things. Exactly. Things. You want yeah. to break that, but in the process you're reinforcing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so hard. Parenting's not easy. Mm-hmm. But man, our, our kids deserve the best, right? Yes. yes. They deserve the best of us. We can always do that. And if we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the ability yeah. to do better. Yeah. In our age group, we were raised in a time where everything was just black and white. Yeah. You know, it's not, it doesn't work these days. He may just think it's black. And the thing is, we live in the world of gray. There's not a lot of black and white. No. Which means there's got to be multiple ways to get to the same point. Yeah. And multiple ways to teach the same thing. Because what works for me doesn't necessarily work for you know kids in ministry, kids in my work, mm-hmm. you know, my own daughters. It's am I invested and committed enough to find to find that path? Oh, no. Yeah. So it only happens out of love. Well, man, I appreciate you guys coming. Yes, sir.